ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight is a lady who is no stranger to the media landscape in Ghana. Let's welcome Shamima Muslim. Thank you so very much, Soji. And it's really an honor to be called upon to introduce this distinguished son of the land who also happens to be our guest for this May Day edition of the series. T.T., as he is affectionately called, became a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Ghana in Legon in October 1973 for a term. And then from October 1974. During a 15 year period teaching at the faculty, the students included former Speaker of Parliament Doha Jabu, as including the Honorable Ken Drasa, Freddie Blay, Joe Gatte, and Alban Bagwin. TT also taught. Current Chief Justice, Justice Enim Yabwa, Justices Ansa, Doche, Badegbe, and most of the other Justices of the Supreme Court and Justices of other courts. He had studied at the law, at the law faculty from October 1966 when he entered age 16. He obtained first class honors in June 1969 at the age of 18. He then went on to do postgraduate studies at Bodham. He went on to postgraduate studies at Bodham College, Oxford University, on a University of Ghana scholarship. He obtained first class there too in honors in BCL, equivalent of a master's degree in law at Oxford in June 1971. He was appointed a junior research fellow at Corpus Christi College, Oxford University, when he was also a law, where he was also a law tutor from October 72 to September 74. Now his life as a lawyer during the 1970s, that was the Achampon military regime, as junior counsel to Joe Randolph, he played an active role in cases that sought freedom for personalities like Mr. William Ofori Atta, Pauli as he was called, and Mr. Sam Okujeto when they were thrown into jail by the regime, as well as hundreds of other Ghanaians who were in prison during that period. The case was entitled Republic versus Director of Prisons, Ex parte Ango Dagomba. Again, as junior counsel to Joe Randolph, he represented Captain Kodo Chikata in his trial before a military tribunal during the Achampong regime. In the same period, he represented Professor Kofi Awuno when he too was on trial. He still continued to rest in peace. T.T. was junior counsel to William Adumwa Bosman in representing Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings as he was then when he too was on trial before a military tribunal in May 1979 before the June 4 uprising. He was lead counsel for the NDC in the election petition that followed the 2012 elections. He has acted as counsel in many important cases that have become reference points in our legal system. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome with a round of applause, Mr. Tachu Chikata. Thank you very much, Shamima. May I thank the Center for Social Justice for the invitation to share some thoughts related to our national politics on their platform. I have to say that I am impressed by how skillfully I got coaxed into this assignment through a couple of virtual meetings I had not too long ago with Dr. Soji Soji Tete. 
I also appreciate the kind introduction of Shamima, which just reconfirmed for me the significance of what I have chosen to speak on. Shamima, you brought yourself and you're going to be on the spot by the time I'm done this evening. The selection by former president John Mahama of Professor Nana Jane Opokuajiman as the vice presidential candidate of the NDC in the 2020 presidential elections has been hailed as historic. It is the first time a major political party has a woman on the ticket. My aim in this conversation is to locate this historic decision in the context of the NDC as the party on whose ticket she is standing. And in doing this, I am of course keenly aware that many people who are not NDC, in fact, some people who previously were against the NDC have felt excited about the appearance on the scene of Professor Opoku Ajiman. Not only among women has there been excitement and solidarity based obviously on recognition of the potential for women's empowerment that this could represent, but among men too, there appears to be excitement. A paramount chief said he had danced boogaloo on hearing the news of Nana's nomination. Even the negative reactions, especially from males who have tried to diminish her worth, seem to reflect the jolt, if not the seismic impact that this selection of Professor Puku Ajiman has generated or is generating. So you would be justified to ask me why I'm having a discussion that is focused on placing the decision of President Mahama within the context of the NDC. My first and obvious reason is that if she's coming on the ticket of that party, then it is important to understand that party and its history so as to understand whether she fits in and if she does, how she does. My second and more important reason for this focus is that I am going to try and demonstrate that it is if the NDC itself has or develops a full appreciation of the historic nature of the choice that its flag bearer made to have Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman as running mate, that the party can mobilize the majority of the electorate to its historic decision. In other words, harnessing the excitement around the vice presidential candidate, recognizing and embracing her value has to be an important element in how the party projects itself to the people of Ghana. I'm going to insist that it is important for the NDC to reach out beyond its existing support base in order to make itself appealing to the people of this nation in the forthcoming elections. I will advance this position by touching on a few elements of what I perceive as the current national environment. May I say that I'm not assuming that everyone in this conversation is NDC or even sympathetic to the NDC. I do assume though, that we all have an interest in social justice and in achieving this in our country. In the conversation that follows my remarks, I'm keen to hear the perspectives of others on what the national environment looks and feels like, and whether my view of the relevance of the nomination of Nana as vice presidential candidate of the NDC, the relevance for both the NDC and the nation at large, whether my view is reasonable or plausible. I'd be very keen 
to hear other perspectives. The NDC, as we all should recall, owes its origins to the period of the PNDC. The very name that was chosen for the party tied it to those origins. And there is no question that the man of destiny in that period around whom the NDC came together was President Jerry John Rawlings. There's also no question that his convictions about social justice, his passion for writing what he saw as going wrong in the society drove actions of his which thrust him onto the national stage from June 4, 1979 through the December 31st, 1981 revolution and on to his being the first presidential candidate of the NDC in the 1992 elections. In highlighting the NDC coming out of the PNDC, I need to underline the fact that the PNDC under Chairman Jerry Rawlings led Ghana into a period of economic recovery after a long period of serious decline. That decade of economic as well as political recovery was during a time often referred to as Africa's lost decade. So Africa was losing a decade while Ghana was gaining a period of economic recovery. It is very easy to forget the deaths to which the country had sunk before that rescue mission. I would encourage all of us to recall and appreciate the history of the pre-PNDC era and the impact of what happened under the PNDC culminating in the 1992 constitution and the fourth republic, which we still are enjoying. Some of you on this program may have been university students in that period and experienced, for instance, the mobilization of the country as a whole to evacuate Coco that was locked up in the countryside because of all the broken down infrastructure, as well as the collapse of national institutions such as the Coco Board at the time. That mobilization, for instance, was a key part of the restoration of the economy and bringing about a period of sustained economic growth and national development. An aspect of that involved insisting on justice for the cocoa farmer whose share of the world market price of cocoa during that period was minimal. By changing that situation and ensuring that the farmer of obtain a significant and increasing share of the world market price. We may today take that policy for granted, but it was achieved through that history of economic recovery and its continuation under the NDC governments that succeeded the PNDC. It was in the PNDC period that renegotiation of the agreements under which electricity from the Akosombo Dam was supplied to the Kaiser Aluminium Company enabled Ghana to obtain a fairer share of the value from the US company's operations in Ghana. It was also in that period that the national electricity grid was extended to the northern parts of the country as part of a deliberate policy of not just electricity provision, but of national integration and unification. People in the northern parts of the country were as entitled to electricity from the Akosombo Dam as those in the south. 
And whatever the reservations of the Volser River Authority at the time, Chairman Rawlings and the PNDC would have nothing of it. A national electrification program was initiated which began to extend electricity to all corners of the country. I want to insist that we are taking, we're tending to take for granted today the scale of the transformation that occurred during that critical decade. And therefore, we are in danger of allowing those who wish to rewrite the nation's history free reign. The revival of our mineral sector, especially our gold mining sector, and the restoration of Ghana to its pride of place as among the biggest exporters of gold from the continent of Africa began during this critical decade of economic recovery. It was in that decade of the 90s, 1980s also that Ghana embarked on a determined effort to, be, to attract investment to enable the country find our own oil and gas resources instead of the situation in which imports of oil products took up most of the foreign exchange the country earned from the toil of the cocoa farmer. The emphasis on human development as the essence of economic growth was also reflected from the earlier stages of the economic recovery program. Through a program of actions to mitigate the social costs of adjustment, PAMSCAN it was known as, a program that was firmly embedded into decisions on the economy. It drove the emphasis, that emphasis on, on, on human development, drove the attention to redressing the development imbalance between the urban and the rural areas of the country. It drove the programs of poverty alleviation. This emphasis was also the driver of educational reforms such as the free compulsory universal basic education program, as well as other education reforms. I have outlined just barely this impact of the PNDC period because it was undoubtedly the reason why the country elected President Rawlings standing on the ticket of the NDC as the first president of the Fourth Republic. I also believe that the history of that rescue mission needs to be told and documented so that those who are eagerly seeking to rewrite the history of our country in so many ways do not distort that history. Of course, it will be told accur accurately with whatever challenges and imperfections there were. It must be told for our youth to understand the rescue mission that took place some decades ago and related to their experiences today. Obviously, the rolling spot of the axis in my topic is clear from what I have said so far. What about the mill spot? In 1996, President Rawlings invited Professor John Evans Atta Mills to be his running mate after the falling out with his previous running mate, Koaka who actually contested on the ticket of his opponent, the NPP. Professor Mills was an academic lawyer by background, clearly a patriot who identified himself as an Nkrumah. He sometimes referred to the orientation he received at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute during his student days. But Professor Mills had not been involved in the politics of the NDC. He had accepted to be part of the reform and revitalization of the internal revenue service, but he was not really a politician, we might say. His integrity, as well as his humility, and his dedication to public service were all traits which clearly attracted President Rawlings. John Evans Atta Mills had what I may call the charisma of integrity. The choice of running mate at a time 
when those opposed to President Rawlings had been given a boost by his own former vice president not now joining their ranks, was obviously an important one. And choosing Professor Mills proved to be one of the judgments that enabled President Rawlings and the NDC to retain the confidence of the electorate in the 1996 elections. Professor Mills went on to prove himself an able, dedicated, and loyal vice president during the second term of President Rowling. <coughs> By the end of that second term, President Rowling himself was clear in his mind that the mantle of leadership had to be passed on to his former vice president. And despite some rumblings within the NDC, that came to be, and President and Vice President Mills became the presidential candidate of the NDC in the 2000 elections. I do not have time today to go into the NDC losing those elections and more controversially also the 2004 elections. I simply want to underline three things about Professor Mills. His character and personality, a person of integrity, someone who was peace loving and not out to seek vengeance against political opponents were huge positives for the NDC, especially when corruption and political vengeance were on full display from the incumbent government at its highest levels during the years NDC was in opposition. For many Ghanaians who were tired of the cycles of vengeance in our politics and who saw how corruption depleted national resources for personal enrichment, Professor Mills was a breath of fresh air. My second point is that Professor Mills had to withstand a challenge from Mrs. Nana Kunedu Ajuman Rawlings before he retained his position as flag bearer of the party for the 2008 elections. He was overwhelmingly successful, indicating that by now, from a situation in 1996, when he was a newcomer within the NDC, he had become the person who led the NDC from eight years in opposition to victory in 2008. My third point in respect of Professor Mills is that even in death, the strength of his charisma of integrity and of his determination to remain that Sundri Hene brought this country together in grief in a very powerful way. Even political opponents of his could not help acknowledging what he represented and how his character had been important for the country in that period. International dignitaries like Hillary Clinton came to pay tribute to him at his funeral. And I mentioned Hillary Clinton in particular in this time and in this conversation out of her role in championing women's empowerment, we today have in the United States of America, a black woman, Kamala Harris, as the vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Party. So when the leadership of the NDC, including President Rawlings, all paid tribute to the memory of President Mills as Asundri Park last month, they were in effect acknowledging what I am expressing in referring to the Rawlings Mills axis of the NDC. And so what does all that have to do with the choice by President Mahama of his running mate? Let me remind you of what President Rawlings said of Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman when she was introduced to him 
by President Mahama. She's a woman of integrity. He's quoted as saying, clearly signaling what was critical to his approval of the running mate. I could not help recalling President Rowling's own choice of Professor John Evans at Mills more than 20 years earlier. At the time we settled on this topic for this presentation, Professor Nanajin Opokwajiman had not been adored and she had not given that remarkable maiden speech. So I was going to try and show her significance for the social democratic traditions of the NDC by drawing on some of her character traits, including her humility, her industry and so on, which have been on display in the course of her public service. I was going to draw on her work as vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, the first female to head a public university in Ghana, and her work as minister of education, for instance. Inevitably, I was going to make further comparisons with Professor Mills, especially in terms of their disciplined character in each case, and also in terms of what I know about the passion that both professors have had for the youth of this country, the next generation. My task has been made much easier by that wonderful speech that Nana gave. And I can do no better than take us through that speech to show how completely aligned this running mate is with the ideals and the political traditions of the NDC. <clears throat> After her opening remarks, this is how she proceeds to describe what she recognizes to be the significance of President Mahama's decision. She says, it is a new focal point for girls and women. You have respected women. The women of Ghana will not forget. The youth will remember. Generations to come will commit your decision to memory and make it a reference point. We will partner with our men and youth as we have always done and work hard to achieve peace in our land because that is the best way to respond to this high recognition. Making history is gratifying. But what really matters is not to be the first through the door. What matters is to hold the door open for those behind us and create other avenues for self-actualization for many more. That is the work for the next four years. She's already setting out her agenda for the next four years. And, and I think that what she goes on to say, we, men, women, our youth and children, we all have a chance to finally make our dreams of serving this country at high levels, of removing doubts and proving once again that we are capable. This is the time we have been waiting for. So I believe that her expression is clearly in alignment with what the NDC has stood for. And when she says, I'm excited to make the case to the good people of Ghana as to why the J&J &J ticket is best poised to confront the daunting challenges of our time and usher Ghana into recovery and prosperity and continues. It will be my mission to ensure that the voices and 
concerns of our children, our youth, our aged, and our persons with, our, with disabilities are reflected in critical decisions. Now, these themes, I believe, are very much in consonance with the priorities of the NDC as a political tradition in Ghana. The NDC has been a party for whom inclusiveness is important. <coughs> I think you, you'll see on the screen some of the passages that I was just reading from uh, in the speech of Nana Opoku Ajuman. And we can see this inclusiveness also being highlighted in further aspects of what she had to say in that maiden speech. She talks about villages and towns across our country are full of stories like mine. This is where she's talking about the fact that it's not enough just to make good grades and you know, have a good work ethic and so on, but good opportunities are also needed. And so she goes on that villages and towns across our country are full of stories like mine. She identifies with other people, other individuals in the country, in villages and towns. And she says, they are full of parents making untold sacrifices for the sake of their children and their future. They're full of market women, fishermen and farmers toiling in the sun to feed the children on their backs and those they have left behind at home. They're full of young mothers and fathers who are balancing family life, work obligations, and entrepreneurial ambitions. The young mother, and yes, the young father, who often has to manage family life, employment, or entrepreneurship seamlessly. We are a people who jump over many hurdles. This sense of connectedness to the ordinary people around this country is, I believe, a crucial aspect of what the NDC as a political tradition has stood for. And, and, and of course, one recognizes that that contrasts with another tradition in which there appears to be a sense that some people have perhaps a higher place in the affairs of this country than others. We have seen some of the reactions to Nana Pukwajiman saying that all of our ancestors, you know, have um, a place in this country. You know, wherever you come from in this country, uh, each of us and our various ancestors um, have importance for this country. And some people have actually <laughs> questioned that and, and sought to suggest that uh, there is something problematic about that. In fact, uh, someone has even tried to, uh, you know, call up a statement of um, President Nkrumah, you know, in order to try to suggest that President Nkrumah said something which was different. And that is completely a misrepresentation of what uh, President Nkrumah said, of course. So my, my simple point, and, and I should um, begin to uh, round up shortly. My, my simple point is that in this important maiden speech, Nana Opoko Ejiman not only reflected important traditions, important political perspectives of the NDC, but she also spoke to some of our current national challenges. And, and some of those national challenges 
are really staring us in the face as we go into these December 2020 elections. She made reference, not like this words, made reference, for instance, to the, the, the following. She says, referring to the ticket of the NDC, we have chosen the path of peace, inclusiveness, self-reliance, and belief in ourselves. It is an important avenue through which to turn our current circumstances into opportunities that yield dividends for us all. We're living in times where a simple exercise of registering voters for elections has generated acts of violence, acts of challenges to the very nationality of certain people in the country, simply because they come from a particular ethnic group that is along the borders of our country, or particular ethnic groups, I should say, because this has been in relation to not only people in the Volta and Oti regions, but also in the northern region of Ghana. And I believe that, again, Nana Opokwajiman spoke to this situation. All we are doing right now is what has always been a very simple exercise of registration. What is not so simple this time is that the exercise is taking place in a time of dreadful pandemic, a dreadful pandemic that is still evolving and our case number is still rising. As if this is not bad enough, the level of violence, brute force, bloodletting and sheer breakdown of law and order in an otherwise straightforward act of registering to vote is unbefitting of this nation. That was until recently a fulcrum of democracy in our region. How did we descend into that situation? And she goes on. So we, 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 we really have to recognize the times that we are in and recognize that these times have to be addressed by all of us and not just by leaders of political parties, not just by President Mahama or President uh, or Vice President uh, Nana Opokwajiman, as I might call her, um, uh, on the ticket of the of the NDC. But they've got to be addressed by us all as individuals, because if the military are being used in connection with the compilation of the electoral register against certain people in the country. In the face of protests of chiefs, Togbi Fiti of Aflao, a chief in Banda region, heads of Moshi communities in the north and so on. Then we can see the dangers that loom ahead for us as a nation. We've seen a minister of state shooting, as she herself says, into thin air at an election uh, registration, electoral registration center. And, you know, up till now, we're still waiting to understand what the legal consequences will be. It disrupted the registration exercise. The officials had to run away with the equipment and so on. That's the reality we, we, we all are aware of. And again, we have to say what Nana Opokwajiman said, we the people, all of us are the protectors and owners of this country for our collective good. We are the protectors and owners of this country for our collective good. We've had violence in an election. Ayawasu West Wogan, a commission of inquiry constituted to 
look into it, came out with recommendations which were just set aside and nothing really happened to any of those who were shown according to the facts found by that commission to have been connected with the things that happened. And we live in Ghana under a constitution which followed the PNDC era as I described it, and which has a provision such as we see in Article 35.5, the state shall actively promote the integration of the peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on the grounds of place of origin, circumstances of birth, ethnic origin, gender, or religion, creed, or other beliefs. That's what the constitution of Ghana says. That's what we should all be protecting. There are many other national issues of the moment which we don't have time uh, to get into. Issues related to corruption, state assets being taken over for private interests. We have the saga of the PDS, which was part of an attempt to have private sector participation in electricity distribution of Ghana, in Ghana, and which went through a process supported by the uh, you know, Millennium Challenge Corporation of the United States with a $500 million grant that was meant to be infused into our electricity distribution, eventually hijacked into various allocations of private interests and a situation in which clearly the intended financial investment that both local and foreign private sector participants were supposed to put in did not come into the picture. Instead, the payments that you and I make for electricity were diverted into the use of some of the equity participants. We have all kinds of ongoing issues around mineral royalties and so on. We have issues around our history in connection with, you know, whether 1st of July, the, the, first, of, uh, the first republic of Ghana, the, 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 the day that marks Ghana becoming a republic, whether that should be celebrated or whether we should rather celebrate a date in August, which is supposed to honor founders in the plural, as opposed to Kwame Nkrumah as the founder of the nation and so on. So we have these efforts at rewriting our history. And, and then, you know, really sadly and more, um, you know, astonishingly, we, we also have these recent acts of student indiscipline and issues about exam leakages and and, and all that. We have, we have all these issues we're, we're grappling with. I, I believe that uh, a lot of the elements of what Professor Pokwajiman talked about uh, touch on some of these important issues. I think that she has insisted in a way that we should all embrace that our political space should not be filled with insults being hurled at each other. And that is something that resonates with most people. Indeed, I would say that the historical traditions of the NDC have recognized that consistently. So it is clear to me that the NDC is well served by amplifying this voice of the running mate, by ensuring that amidst all the din of partisanship, amidst all the chatter of irrelevance, her message for the nation is heard. I have no doubt in my mind that President Mahama recognized the powerful impact that her choice of running mate would make for the country. In that respect, he was way ahead of many people in the NDC. Let us consider how this historic decision can write a better chapter in the history of our nation. Let us consider particularly how women can seize this moment and take up their rightful positions in the leadership of this country, which is where I put Shamima and others like her on the spot. 
you do not need me to tell you what this decision can mean for women and the nation at large. It is hardly a coincidence that in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the effectiveness of women leaders around the world is gaining more attention. So before I end with the rousing conclusion of the vice presidential candidate of the NDC, may I just quote to be conveyed to Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman, the words of Mordecai to Queen Esther. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And she said in her conclusion, and I quote, Ghana has been poised for far too long. Ghana must be in full flight towards sustainable development, to a destination of peace, inclusion, self-confidence, plain honesty, and where good old hard work matters. We call on all our countrymen, all our country women and men, who believe that our country can once again shovel the path of hope to come join us. The time is now. Forth in the name of our country, we will go. We will not be intimidated. Our resolve to serve this country remains strong. No shaking. We will stay the course. We will not be distracted. We will remain focused. We will raise high the flag of Ghana. The time is now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Chachuchigata. I think that you, you have really um, satisfied our appetite. This has been very well researched, intellectually stimulating, and very thought provoking as well, not to mention providing a lot of inspiration for the ongoing um, campaign. So I'll just start off reading a few of the comments that have come in um, from Ishmael Dodu and Dr. Yakubu Salifu. There's, always, there's already a clamor for your speech. People need a copy of your speech because as Ishmael Dodu says, the historical facts are exciting and he wants to take it up to academic debates. And I think some of the information is really critical for people who are engaged in various ways in the campaign. So I'm sure we can discuss that and what it means. Levelin Esiedu is also lauding the efforts of President Mahama in making a choice in Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman. Um, and then Albert Aheto has a specific question. How can we stop this wicked attempt from the NPP of rewriting the history of Ghana? So perhaps you could start by addressing that specific question, Mr. Chikata. Well, I think that um, the people of Ghana have actually lived and experienced their own history. And so if somebody suddenly decides that 1st July 1960 is no longer significant, I, I don't think they're taken in by that. I think people recognize the fact that the date on which we became a republic for the first time on a motion that was seconded by the predecessors to the current NPP tradition after it had been moved by President Nkrumah, that day is going to be acknowledged and celebrated in the hearts and minds of people, regardless of whether it is being acknowledged as a holiday or it is just being uh, said to be a celebration. Now, when, when you take August 4th, which we are being asked to uh, commemorate because some people gathered in Salt Pond as uh, UGCC and so on, that, you know, we also know what that history represents. The UGCC consisted of people who indeed were 
really solid nationalist figures in their time and who were very key to bringing on board Kwame Nkrumah himself as one of their, you know, as one of them. And, and, and as a result, you know, gave Kwame Nkrumah the prominence that he eventually used to take off with his own, you know, Veranda Boys party. But the reality is simply that Kwame Nkrumah took off from that and led a new movement, the Convention People's Party, which then took us into independent Republican Ghana. I mean, these facts cannot just be discarded. So I would say that even as attempts are being made to rewrite that history, we must also insist on writing the history. We must insist on speaking the history and on doing what is um, expressed often in the Old Testament, you know, which is that you teach your children you know, what is written in the books of the law. You, 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 you teach it to them such that they can recite it and they can recognize it. And, and you know, it's not very difficult uh, to do some of that. The, the, the reality, again, for us as Ghanaians is that we can recognize that Kwame Nkrumah was not just a figure of Ghana's history. Kwame Nkrumah was a, an African giant. And nobody in the big six, apart from Nkrumah, comes anywhere close to reaching that status. Now, that is not to diminish any of the, big, any of the others, because they had their roles in their time and in their context. You know, I, when I was studying law in the University of Ghana, I was excited reading the submissions of Dr. Dankwa in some of the constitutional cases in which, you know, he was in full flow as a lawyer, you know, in the courts. And, and, and that was for me an inspiration in my context as a lawyer. And I'm, I mean, I'm not in any way going to diminish his stature in that context. But that cannot lead me to a conclusion that in terms of the politics of Ghana, his stature must be put on the same pedestal as Kwame Nkrumah. I mean, that would just be ahistorical. So I'm saying that if we avoid making the history of this country about who our party wants to give preference to in terms of recognition as against others, and if we simply want to do history, then we are able to, you know, just deal with the reality of history. And, and when we do that whilst acknowledging the roles of everybody, as, as Nana Opokwajiman says, all of our ancestors have something to show for where we are as a country. Thank you. A statement that has stimulated its own controversy. But as you said, it's time for more people on the other side to also come out and speak their own truth. And thank you for also speaking. You put your finger on a very important quality of Professor, which is her ability to attract support from across various sectors of the Ghanaian society. And this in itself has stimulated certain responses. There are those, for example, who say that Prof is not the candidate. So whatever her qualities, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. What was your response to that type of uh, response? Well, that you know, my response, my, my response is very simple. You know, there is good reason why um, there are vice presidential candidates supporting the, 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 the presidential candidate uh, himself. That's good reason because in the presidency, the vice president is not just, you know, a passenger. The vice president also reflects what the party intends to project to the electorate. So if you look at the United States right now, for instance, president, uh, uh, Vice President Joe Biden selecting Kamala Harris speaks volumes to the electorate, especially to the electorate that the Democratic Party wants to attract. 
And there is no question that in that judgment about that selection, Joe Biden is aware, keenly aware of who can be attracted, who can be mobilized, who can be galvanized. Now, I mean, I don't think President Mahama is a political neophyte by any means. And I'm sure that he recognizes the significance of the choice that he has made. So, so really for me, it, it is a pity when people almost make it seem like it's an either or perspective. You know, you project the president or you project the vice president. That is not the point of the selection. The, the point of the selection is President Mahama's own recognition that you project me and my running mate. In fact, as you know, throughout the country, as we, as we have elections at the parliamentary constituency level as well, parliamentary candidates are also being projected alongside the presidential candidate in the different constituencies. If those down the ticket are not also part of the galvanization of the electorate, who do you expect is going to be going into the parliament in order to represent people in the different constituencies? So I, I think that we should be clear in our minds that the vice presidential candidate of a party like the NDC has a lot to bring to the table. And in the case of Nana Opokwa Juman, just as in the case of President Mills, 1996, it is clear in my mind that there can be an impact of great significance. And, and we saw that already from the kind of excitement and enthusiasm um, that followed not only her nomination, but that followed uh, her maiden speech at her, at her outdoor. There are people who Thank are quite, there, there are people who are quite tired of uh, hearing the voices of politicians, I can tell you that. And people who are refreshed by, by, by hearing, you know, a voice that, you know, speaks to their issues in, in, in very simple, direct terms. I mean, I, I don't think there's any, any, any doubt about the value of that. So on that note, Jifa Bampo talks about the formidable women in the NDC and the fact that the NDC has a track record of promoting women. And indeed, she lists Joyce Bauer, Hannah Tete, Mawena Trepa, Nana Oye Bampoado, Queen Star Sawyer, Dr. Zanato. Her question is, has the party got a strategy for promoting women and getting more women involved in the electoral processes and even in the governance of the party? If not for, for elections, just to be involved in the, in the process at all levels of the party. Well, I think that actually is part of the reason why Professor Nano Pukwajiman's selection is important because that signals, that signals that the party is evolving such a strategy. If it doesn't have a complete strategy already in place, that strategy is being evolved and will obviously revolve around her contribution. And, and, and she will have clearly a responsibility for drawing a lot of the women, not only the names that you mentioned, but you know, a lot of other women who 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 may not necessarily have have been, you know, uh, sort of within the ranks of the NDC previously, but who clearly have a relevance for 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 the country, you know, who who have a relevance not only in terms of you know academic qualifications and so on, but who have a relevance, you know. I remember, I remember in, in 92 when um, um, there were discussions about the, 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 the consultative assembly uh, that was going to be formed. And, and there were people who were saying that, you know, some of the like women, uh, association of women headdressers or women, you know, who were in what seemed to others to be sort of low positions. Why were they all being brought into something like um, the, 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 the consultative assembly for, for, you know, constitution making and so on. Now, the reality that we all have to deal with is that sometimes we are not sensitive enough to what women have already been doing in the life of this country, economically, politically, humanly speaking, and so on. There are women 
who have, through the toil of their trading experiences, looked after their children and educated them to the highest positions and so on and so forth. And I believe that what President Mahama and the NDC are signaling is their sensitivity to this reality of women's involvement in our country and, and, and a sensitivity to the sentiments that Jifa is expressing that women must indeed have a place at the leadership table. But I guess my point, and that is where I put them all on the spot, Shamima, Jifa, and all of you, my point is that it cannot just be left to President Mahama's decision. It, it has to be part of the effort that you and I, particularly you, the women, make to pull together around this decision and to make it happen for women. And I think that in that respect, uh, contrary to the rather silly observation that people like to make that women are their own worst enemies and things like that, contrary to that, I think that what Nana is, is encouraging, is attracting, is that the time is now for women to take out the gauntlet and not to wait for anybody to you know, work on their behalf. The time is now. Women must indeed seize the time. So Jifa, I'm going to be, I'm going to be asking you some questions about how you're going to be seizing the time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll be thinking about that. Nini Ayurebiakwa says that the NDC has raised the bar, and there is also an interesting one that is coming from Gordon. Um, and I would ask that, and then it will be impossible to end without touching on the Ahoy book, but I'll get to that in a bit. He said that the NDC has military antecedent. Some of the selections of its presidential adopting a non-military stance, and that is the, you're, you're, you're breaking. You're, you're breaking. I didn't, I didn't hear the question. His question. Hello? Yeah, I didn't Can hear the question. I didn't hear the question. You were breaking. So you're, you're going to have to repeat the question, I'm afraid. Okay, Gordon's question is NDC presidential and vice presidential candidates that appear to be steering the party away from quote unquote hardliners, deliberate policy around this. Oh, hardliners, who, 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 are, who, are, who are the hardliners and who are the non-hardliners? But, but you, and then the question is, is there a deliberate policy around this? Is that, is that a question? Yes. Well, you is know, I, I'm sorry. Policy around selecting non hard Well, you know, let me say that I don't speak for... Yes, that is the question. Yeah. I, I, I cannot speak for the selection processes of the NDC um, in respect of the selection of leaders because I really have not been involved in the leadership um, of the NDC, really. I mean, you know, the, 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 the ways in which um, the, the current uh, leaders, for instance, have been selected are not things that I'm, I'm completely privy to. But I, I really want to understand what this distinction being made between softliners and hardliners is. Because what I believe the NDC has sought to do over the years has been to select leaders 
who reflect the political traditions that the NDC stands for. So from, from, uh, from, from President Rawlings, you know, who, you know, obviously emerged himself in terms of his convictions and his passions about social justice and his courage in, in taking forward those convictions and, 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 and you know, who reflected, you know, some of the, uh, the key elements of what the, the, the NDC was trying to go for. I mean, he, he was in the military, but that didn't stop him from having these passions that I'm talking about, which some people might say uh, kind of soft positions, social justice, you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, you read uh, something like the, the, the PNDC uh, proclamation and you have references to true democracy and so on, you know, aspirations to democracy. And, and those were coming from somebody with a background in the military, but I don't see a contradiction between that sort of background and a commitment to democracy. Because as we all recognize, yes, the military is a part of the society and, and the military has important contributions that it can make and has made to our society and so on. But when we look at some of the current happenings where the military is being used as an instrument of intimidation against democratic rights, for instance, I don't think that we can by any means see that as you know, some sort of you know, hard line military position that is supported by the military as, as a whole. I don't think you can put it in those terms. I think that is one of the wrongs that we are, we are speaking against. So, I mean, I would need some further clarity from, from the questioner as to what his perceptions are about this soft and hard business, you know, because uh, that, that, that is not my appreciation of, of um, uh, the way that leaders have emerged in, 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 the, in, in, in the NDC. I mean, President Mills, uh, President Mills was selected by President Rawlings as his running mate in 96. I mean, um, yes, Mills had a different temperament. And in a sense, it is a combination of different temperaments, a combination of different human you know, expressions that shows a sensitivity and a reflection of the population at large and the aspirations of the people of Ghana as a whole. So you can't just, you know, sort of narrowly try to prescribe a certain character as, as what leadership should be about. So maybe I'm missing something that uh, we, we, we need to clarify further. I think you've addressed the question, and time would only ask for one more question. And yes, and what's that? Professor Carmen Ahoy. What was the question? Oh dear, I can't hear you at all. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah, I didn't hear the question. What was the question? I didn't. Um, it looks like Suji has an issue with his connection. I'm sure you connect shortly. Okay. But if you had the connect, if you had the question, you can I think I think his, his his question basically has to do with the the book released by the Ahoy. Yeah, so uh, I'm the question was in respect of Tamima, we can't hear you, please. <laughs> so Shamima, I think your voice is, is muted. So let me just ask the last question, which is 
the last question really is your view about the Ahoy book and how you you think the NDC can manage it at this well I think you're you're going to have to wait for my book and um, in the meantime as I've tried to outline there are urgent national concerns that we have to deal with and and I've tried to address some of those concerns and I've tried to recognize that President Mahama and his choice of running mate seek to address those concerns. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for your response to that um, um, explosive comments about that book, but we would have to wait for your, your book, Chachu Chikate's own and with that, we would have to bring the curtain to an end, expressing a lot of gratitude to you. Let me call on Kemeche to close us up within a minute. Stephen Kemeche. Thank you very much, um, Soji. Amuti, we are most grateful for um, honoring our invitation. I have picked some few things in your presentation that I want to highlight. You, for instance, refer to how, as a society, we are not sensitive enough to the role or the impact of women, the positive impact of women uh, on our society. Um, again, I want to say that many of us try to preempt how the discussion will go. I, for one, um, was hoping that you will situate the choice of Nana Jenopoku Adiman, Prof, in the history of the NGC, but you will not fail to uh, set our eyes on, on, on the future. And, and you did exactly that. Um, some of the things you mentioned, you, 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 you mentioned the, the rescue mission the role of uh, President Rawlings in, in, in stopping the, the decay of the society at the time. Then the appearance of prof males on, on the scene, and particularly your, your um, comment on prof males, let me see if I, charisma of integrity. So again, our understanding is that President Rawlings' intervention at the time was needed. President Mills' intervention at the time was needed. And then you do this interesting uh, comparison between Prof. Mills and Nana Jinopoku Ajiman and what she represents in the present day going forward and what she represents to women and to girls in our society a choice couldn't be um, more important um, uh, than, than, than now. So thank you very much, Ankiti. On behalf of the center, I want to say a big thank you. We are most grateful for having agreed to join us at this discussion. Um, we, we are looking forward to inviting you again on other interesting topics. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to say thank you to everyone who has joined us. Uh, we had as many as uh, 100 plus people joining at the point. We are most grateful that you all could make the, point, uh, the time to, to join us. I have some few um, announcements or information to pass on. As Oji mentioned, this is a series of, of discussions, the Leadership Dialogue Series. So the next one is scheduled for September 17th. Um, the topic is Social Democracy in Ghana, a meaningless slogan or a feasible approach to social transformation. 
And this will be delivered by Dr. Omani Boama, who we all know is a former Minister of Communication in the NGC government. We also have two other um, dialogue series scheduled for the month of October, and there, thereafter that you, you um, inform you about. Then we are also putting out um, at this time uh, a call for volunteers to join the center, um, progressive-minded volunteers in the areas of education and social transformation, health and equity, finance and economy, gender and social inclusion, politics and public policy. So if you have expertise in any of these areas, uh, please reach out and let's work together to advance the progressive agenda in our country. Now, I want to also mention that uh, visit our okay. website, um, csjghana.org. Oh, our Twitter account, CSJ Ghana. You shouldn't be. Uh, I'll give it. I'll give it. Uh, well, I think I'll use it. Now, as you mentioned at the beginning of the program, yeah. you will send me a post event survey to all participants. And uh, we'll be grateful if you can give us your comments so that we can be guided in, in, in organizing a subsequent um, uh, okay. program. We thank you once again for joining us. We are grateful and we we'll call on you again. Um, we, we, on that note, um, we call it an evening. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. T. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen Kemeche. I think that that brings proceedings to an end. So see you with the next invite and talk again soon. Bye. -bye.